So Frank Isola of the New York Daily News joins us now. Frank, how you doing, man? Good. You know, I, I volunteered to come in, but Ryan thought it would be it could be a little awkward. So let me just thank uh, Don for letting me sit in his seat on uh, Friday. I, uh, I really appreciate the oh, hour I spent. Anytime. There's no awkwardness. Come on in. Did if, you hear? Did you did you see the reviews? I've heard it was very good. The yeah, Rolling Stone gave off it, the charts. Ro- great. Rolling Stone gave it four stars. Called it the must listen radio of uh, of the season. Mushnick and Raceman gave it two thumbs up. Neil Best only gave it two and a half stars for obvious reasons, but otherwise... Well, he, he, he was busy <laughs> listening to somebody else. But, Frank, what I found interesting <laughs> is that you love the job so much. Come and take it. If you think you can take it, come take it. As I told Mike, I enjoy it so much that I don't even want to, I don't even want to get paid. I'll work for free. Oh, it's, it's, that, that is the oh, cardinal sin. Oh, you're singing the ESPN oh, song. Oh, it, it, what it, a young it, man. Yeah. It's so it's like, it's so much fun. It's not even really work. I mean, you want you want to be here's here's a job. If you want to work and be miserable, you get into the newspaper business. Mike could back me up on this. That's like real work. Yep. Radio is like a, it's like sitting at a bar without a drink and without women there. But other than that, it's uh, sports radio is fun. Well, I've always said this, and people get mad at me. Uh, the hardest I ever worked was as a newspaper writer. I'm not saying this job is easy, like Frank just said, but nothing compares to how hard you have to work as a newspaper writer. I have such respect for those guys. All right, let's get serious here for okay. a moment. Is there a real chance that Kerr could possibly say no to Phil Jackson? I think there's a chance just for this reason. He's on, you know, he's a West Coast guy. I guess his daughter goes to Cal Berkeley. It's a little bit more convenient for him to stay there. He's, moved, you know, he'd be taking over a team. Now, granted, it is the Western Conference, but it is a team that won 51 games uh, last season. I think that he also looks at the Nick job and says it's better than 37 wins. You know, I think that he believes he can get them back into the playoffs next year, assuming Carmelo Anthony comes back and they make a couple of uh, minor adjustments. Plus, he has all the confidence in the world in uh, in Phil Jackson. I would think that Steve Kerr's probably a little just concerned about the way things work in the Nick organization, because even though, hey, you know he's going to make a lot of money by coming here and they live in New York and all that, the Mecca and all this other stuff. But I keep saying, you know, Lenny Wilkins lasted 82 games. You know, Larry Brown lasted 82 games, also Hall of Famers. And I think Steve Kerr is legitimately concerned about, you know, how things might shake out there in New York. That being said, he does have unbelievable confidence in Phil Jackson. They have a very good relationship. I still think he'll end up in New York. But why is it taking so long? Well, I mean, a he's in uh, he's working right now, and I think he probably felt somewhat obligated to fulfill his obligation with uh, TNT. Now he'll do tomorrow night's game, Oklahoma City and the Clippers, and then TNT is basically off for the weekend. So he's finally going to get to go home. He's been in Oklahoma City for uh, for a week now which is, I guess, basically like doing hard time in uh, Leavenworth. So he'll be happy to get home to San Diego, and his wife is with him right now. So obviously they're talking about it, but, uh, you know, teams have been reaching out to him, and I have to believe that the Warriors are one of those teams. I'll bet you once their season ended, I'll bet you they reached out to Steve Kerr. He's got a relationship with the owner already, so that job is certainly going to be uh, appealing. So. You know, maybe it looked like for a while it was going to be a fait accompli that he would end up in New York, but now it's probably up in the air a little bit. Like I said, I still think he'll coach the Knicks. Uh, I, I got to laugh at one thing, though, Frank, because you just said what a lot of people are saying. You know, he hasn't had a chance to talk to his family. I work two full-time jobs, and I'm on the road. And I could still carve out two hours to talk to Jody on the phone. I mean, you have to sit with somebody face-to-face to ask him, honey, should I take this job or not? Well, uh, it's... I mean, I'm brutal on the phone, so I kind of understand that. <laughs> Maybe he figured, you know, it's easier if they're spending, you know, time together in uh, Oklahoma. No matter how you look at it, it's it's a big, uh, it, it's a big move financially. Yeah, it's it's a it's a home run for him. But you know, you are doing TV. He's got this big high profile. There's less stress to it, and I'm sure that they're probably figuring out a lot of things. And I'm sure part of them. You know, the idea of coming to New York, it definitely appeals to him. What I like about the way Steve Kerr is looking at it, he's not just jumping into it, you know, because Phil Jackson's there and it's the Knicks. He really wants to make it work, which I think for Knicks fans who have seen, you know, seen the team only win one playoff series in 14 years, that should, that's something they should be happy about, that, you know, he wants to make sure that he goes in there and he can get things done his way. He should have power. He and Phil Jackson should have power on, you know, 
who works for the team and who travels with the team. You need that because the Knicks' way of doing things, you know, the, the Knicks take care of their employees financially, but their way isn't working. There's no other way around it. They've only won one playoff series in 14 years. Phil mm-hmm. Jackson and Steve Kerr know a lot more about winning than anybody else does at Madison Square Garden. So the key will be, will they listen to both of those guys, assuming Clay takes the job? And the hope is that Mark Jackson's, I mean, uh, Phil Jackson's going to be able to change that culture. Now, Frank, is Steve Kerr's ego small enough to handle coming here, being successful with the Knicks, and all of the credit going to Phil Jackson for it? I don't think he'll mind that. And I think the one thing that you guys will, if it is Steve Kerr, uh, you know, and if you have him on the radio, I mean, Steve is great with the media. Mm-hmm. You know, he knows how to, he knows how to work, and I'm not going to say he's on the Doc Rivers level, which is I you know. And the same thing with Jeff Van Gundy, but he's very good. He's very personable. He's uh, he's a he's a really good guy. He's he's obviously got uh, a good personality. So I think he likes Phil Jackson. Phil Jackson's his guy. I think it would be a lot different if Phil were hiring somebody else. Because here's the thing too, when training camp starts, Phil Jackson's going to be on the court. And he'll, I'm sure he'll be somewhat involved maybe early on in some of the practices. And I think someone – I don't think Steve Kerr would be the kind of guy that would feel threatened by that. Now, if you know, Phil Jackson were traveling with the team and sitting behind the bench, that would be something different. But I think early on, I think their relationship is good enough. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why Phil wants to hire Steve, because he, A, believes he'd be good, and he obviously knows that he can work with him, which is important. Because you see, you see what happens when these GM and coaches – all don't get along. I mean, look at the Warriors. We've kind of known all year, all year that something was probably going to happen with Mark Jackson, despite the fact that he won 51 games. If Steve Kerr takes the Warriors job, let's just go off the rails here. If he takes the Warriors job, is there any chance that Phil would think of Mark as a, as a coach, or who would be a second choice if Steve Kerr says, "No, I'm going to I'm going to stay in the West you know Coast." What? I really don't know the answer to that. Uh, you know. I would think that Phil would want to hire somebody that he's comfortable with. Could he be comfortable with Mark Jackson? Who knows? Maybe they've hit it off famously. You don't know until you work with somebody. But it, it, it's, I, we know one thing. It would be very popular among the fans. That's for sure. But, but who knows? I'm not, I wouldn't know either way. I do know this about Phil Jackson. He's got a very small circle of kind of coaching buddies and people like that. And Steve is obviously one of them. Bill Cartwright is another one I spoke to him today. And Bill Cartwright certainly made it seem like that he was coming uh, to New York, uh, you know, regardless of uh, whether or not Steve Kerr is going to be the head coach. So Phil certainly wants to bring his people, and he's obviously brought in uh, Clarence Gaines Jr. to be a scout. So Phil wants to surround himself with his guys and the guys that he feels comfortable with, and he should do that. And it, he's obviously in the process of, uh, of doing that. Frank, how surprised are you that the road team has been so successful here in the postseason? Well, I think, you know, if you look at a lot of them, especially the ones in the Western Conference, they were all, you know, except for Dallas, which was a 49-win team, those other teams all won 50-plus games. And then Indiana uh, was, you know, was falling apart at the end of the year. So Atlanta winning a couple of games there, I guess, wasn't too surprising. Probably the most surprising one of all, when you get right down to it, would be the Nets winning a Game 7 in Toronto because the other home teams that were home for a Game 7 all ended up winning. Yet the Nets were able to come through with the big play late in the game. But it's what it's done is it's made for. I think it's kind of made it like the way hockey is because I really I don't really buy any of that home ice advantage in hockey. And I think maybe uh, for the NBA, I think it's a good sign. That being said, look at Miami, who you know, my, I, you know, you, you forgot what LeBron looked like. He hasn't played, and I guess the last time they played is April 28th. They've been the one team that's taking care of business, while every other team has certainly struggled. Indiana on the verge of elimination twice. Oklahoma City on the verge of elimination twice, and then obviously the San Antonio Spurs had to play Game 7. So it's made the playoffs very good, but after all that was said and done, those higher seeds all ended up advancing with the exception of the three seed in the East and the four seed in both the East and the West. All right, final thing, Frank. Who's winning the Nets in the Heat? I think the Heat uh, will win. I'd love to see the Nets do it. I would, I would love to see the Nets get one of the first two games. It would make it much more competitive. You guys, you guys know how this works, especially in the NBA. If you're going to beat a higher-seeded team, you got to beat them twice, at least twice on their home court. The Nets were able to do that to Toronto. They're going to have to win one of those first two games in Miami because i got to think that LeBron is going to win either game three or game four in Brooklyn, so it would serve the Brooklyn Nets uh, very well if they could get one of those first two games, which is entirely fine. I think it's going to be a good series because Pierce and Garnett hate the Heat. Garnett had his issues with Ray Allen, so it could actually be a lot of fun watching all those old geezers running around the court. (laughs) Frank, good stuff. Thanks a lot. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Frank.